Hello everyone and welcome to our side of the net. Hopping on a call today, we have Ollie Newton, who is an international speaker and advocate for mental health and neurodiversity. Inspiring individuals worldwide to reclaim the lives through the transformative power of movements. Ollie is the founder of Run For Your Mind, and I'm so happy to speak with him today. Let's bring him in. Oliver, welcome to our side of the net. How are you doing today? Very good, thank you. Um, not too bad. Where, what time is it where you are? We are, it's just coming up to 9.30. What about yourself? 5.30 in the afternoon. So my working day is just coming to an end. <laughs> um, so I'd love to start, I think it makes sense to start kind of at the very beginning. Um, I'd love to hear all about your your story um, and your journey with mental health and uh, everything that that's brought you up till today. I guess it's probably best starting at the very beginning when I knew I was a little bit different. I was probably around six or seven years old. I remember being on holiday with my family. We'd just been out for a meal in Spain and I was walking down this street and touched this lamppost with my right hand, carried on walking about 100 metres down the road and then I just had this this fear, this overwhelming fear that if I didn't go back and touch the lamppost that my whole family were going to die. So I ran back, I touched the lamppost and I honestly believed by completing that one little act that, you know, I'd saved everyone's life. But I guess little did I know back then that was going to be the start of something that was going to materialise in something pretty difficult as the years went on. Uh, you know, little things started to, to surface. I was predominantly around routine times so I was having to like check my wardrobes before I went to sleep on a night I think I'd seen a film on monsters and I was sure that there was monsters in my cupboard and I was doing these little checks at like seven years old and it started wow. off by just doing one little loop of my room and then it sort of built up and built up and you know within a matter of months I was doing 30 40 50 checks and I always remember my dad and mum were in the bedroom underneath me because I was like in the attic loft room and they'd be banging on the ceiling after about 45 minutes like what on earth are you doing I'd go down in the morning and um yeah my dad would they'd always question me my dad my dad always used to say it was like sleeping under a, a greyhound track because I was going <laughs> around my room at like 100 miles an hour but so did you I open up at that point or did you no, tell them what you were doing it. Okay. No, I couldn't tell them because the um, unfortunately, with the thoughts I was having, the fear that was attached to the thoughts was that if I, you know, if I if I did tell them that they'd die, something bad would happen to them. And you know, that same thing, the lamppost. It was like I had to complete these routines and rituals because if I didn't, I believe something bad was going to happen to them. So, yeah, I couldn't I couldn't open up at that at an early age at all about it. And you know, don't get me wrong, life was good. I had a I was very fortunate growing up. You know. Um, I didn't really go without anything. I wasn't wasn't like I was spoiled, but you know I had everything I needed and a loving family. But I just, you know, these little things were just there, and I, I guess I sort of managed, probably because I was so active out out. You know, when I wasn't out, I was. I believe sport played a huge part in my life growing up um, until things went really wrong when I was in sort of like my later years. But um, yeah, I think I was maybe self medicating through. You know, I was playing sports every day, football, cricket, rugby, anything I could do, I was there doing it. And I think that played a massive part in sort of getting me through them early years. Did you, when you were playing the sports, do you think, do you think it did switch everyone off? I mean, we hear, we hear certainly uh, football players and, you know, well, certainly athletes that maybe suffer from mental health or even if it's just, not mental health, but stresses in their own personal lives when they when they go onto the soccer field or the tennis court or the swimming pool, whatever it is, they kind of are able to switch everything off. Is that what happened to you, or did the, these thoughts keep keep if I'm happening? Honest with you, yeah, it just it wasn't something I realised I was doing back then. It was more like built around sort of routine time. So. And it's really common with what I was struggling with that it is around routine times where you're not really. So like when I was at school, 
you wouldn't have known anything. Walking to school, which was sort of your routine thing, I would yeah. be stepping on crates, I'd be touching lampposts, but very discreetly, people wouldn't really notice it. Like, no one really would have picked it up. I was able to sort of mask it, mask how I was feeling. And then in school, it just wasn't a thing for me. It was just, you know, until maybe like my teens, but it was, yeah, very sort of, you know, I guess it just sort of, yeah, yeah. It, no one could really see it, I guess. So, yeah. And then and I was able to hide it. Yeah, and obviously I think, you know, I, I assume back when you were in school, there wasn't the support that there is now for maybe maybe you felt a little bit alone that you were definitely. actually the only person, which, to be honest with you, you definitely weren't because, you know, I, I don't think I was to the extreme, obviously, but I certainly did things and, you know, I'm sure there's, there's hundreds of uh, people who were walking to school doing very similar things, which is Absolutely. crazy to think about. Yeah, it's really um, common in young people. And and I guess, I think my message really now is more aimed at maybe parents, uh, especially, especially when talking about my younger years, like addressing these signs, being able to openly speak about, you know, and have these conversations with people about these things from a from a younger age, just so that, you know, we are talking about it because in this day and age, it's very different. Like people learn about this sort of type of stuff in school. They're more exposed to it. But at the same time, young people aren't seeing people like myself very often actually opening up about it or other young people yeah. around them opening up about it, which is, you know, I think when you're in that situation, you you definitely do feel very alone. You do feel like the, you're the only person who's got that. No one else is going to have this. So it's, yeah it's it's quite scary really yeah yeah i think you've you've been able to come out of this just in an incredible way which we'll get into but were you exercising at all through this period no, like not really no um there was there was I the football and stopped and everything no tennis. Yeah, there was one, i guess there was one time when i you know late on when i um I did try getting to the football, but I had to quit quite early on because I just couldn't focus, like boiling hot outside. And I ended up going into my cupboard. I put on some uh, old gym kit that I hadn't worn for maybe um, 10 years. Um, wow. some old, it's like some old trainers. I started to walk and then I, was, I didn't intend to go running, but I started to run. And then after about, probably about 40 minutes, I'd, I'd ran this loop of four or five kilometres um, very slowly running, walking, running, walking. But when I stopped, everything stopped for the first time in 10 years. My what? thoughts stopped. <laughs> and I was like, this is ridiculous. And then from that moment on, I just, I guess I just lived for that feeling. And um, and it sent me on this absolute wild journey of running, you know, averaging since that day in 2017, I've averaged 10 kilometers a day for for just just coming up to seven years, so twenty four thousand kilometers, roughly, um, uh, and I would just live for that feeling. And don't get me wrong, some days it lasts two minutes, three minutes. Some days it lasts an hour, and I'm in a different place now, yeah. totally. But I was living for that feeling, and the further I ran, the easier it got. I feel sorry for my wife; she'd be like ringing me, like some days, like where are you? And I'd be like, I'm just in a, a different city at the minute. I'm, I'm, I live in Leeds. I'd be like, I'm in Bradford. I'm about two hours away. I'm just running. And she's yeah. like, and you know, and it was difficult because it took a lot of time up, but I started to rebuild my life through running and, you know, piece my life back together. And when I say, you know, them early years when I was saying about how I was self-medicating, I had no idea I was, but I must have been because this was giving me a totally different lease of life again. And, you know, it wasn't yes. until I look back and think, actually, that period where I didn't do look after myself as much, I was drinking more, I was going out with my friends more, you know, neglecting myself a bit, that was the period where I guess things would have gone quite wrong. But very early on, you know, within three or four weeks of starting running, I was like, I need to share this. Like, I need to tell yeah. people about the benefits of this. And I set up a social media account, which is called Run For Your Mind, and, you know, with no real idea or direction of where I wanted to go, I used to send this little drone up and it used to follow me on my runs and I used to put the, you know, the videos up. I started yeah. to really open up about the the impact that OCD, anxiety and depression was having and had had on my life. 
And I thought I'd be able to help people on the back of it. But actually, in turn, I was really starting to help myself because people were saying, I'm, I've been through this same thing. And yeah. I was like, oh, wow, I'm not alone with this. And, you know, built a community. We've got like 4,000 runners now all over the world, you know, um, who, who come together. Uh, you know, we've set up a Strava club. We connected through social media. We talk. But I think yeah. the biggest, I guess, the biggest turning point for me was, you know, three years ago, roughly, you know, because what running was enabling me to do was it was creating the freedom from the thoughts. It was giving me these moments of respite from from that thing that had haunted me for so long. I set myself a challenge to try and share my story somewhere. And I got the opportunity very early on uh, at a work event. They were doing something called the Untold Stories of the Business. And it was about six months later, they asked me and they were like, do you want to share your story? I was like, no. I was like, you know, 300 people, anxiety on top of anxiety, but I did it. And, you know, from there, it's, I guess, it sent me on this incredible journey of just like, yeah. you know, sh- sharing my story and supporting thousands of people all over the place you know i've delivered talks to some of the biggest organizations in the world i've i've, I've recently you know where we got the opportunity to work together work yeah. with young tennis athletes in across whistler and calgary and you know did some yeah. work with vancouver fc and it's just been for me it's been unbelievable you know uh, and and yeah. i've shared my story i think now to spoken to over you know in person i've delivered you know talks to over 30 30, 000 people so it's been and the amount That's of incredible. people i've been able to support on the back of that has been huge and and i and i just feel like maybe it was all meant to be after all but it's, yeah it's for you tough. to yeah for you to to talk about what you went through in spain to then tell me and you know everyone who's listening that you've delivered you know talks to over 30,000 people is remarkable really so one thing that i wanted to to ask was when when you had the conversation with ruth about kind of educating yourself through that process did anything come up about exercise and running like was that at the back of your mind when you suddenly woke up one day and decided to do it or was that do you like was that something that just seems like it was meant to be? Exercise was never really mentioned to me, if I'm honest. It was never something that was ever said, oh, you should probably, you know, you should probably do that. Or you could, you could get, could you, would you be interested in getting back into, into football or any of these things? Um, and I didn't really realise it even at that stage, how sort of um, important exercise was, you know, for me as a child and for me, for me in you know in later life so yeah i wish it was mentioned uh but it wasn't unfortunately about them yeah because i i do believe now that the focus you know is on talking to people and you know making sure that you're opening up but which i think is obviously hugely important but it's that is a very difficult thing to do you know absolutely but yeah. putting on running shoes and at least maybe getting outside for fresh air walking i I, i'm not i'm i haven't put my i can't put myself in your position but that seems if if you if someone was to tell you to do that that surely would maybe be a better step for not everyone but yeah like if someone said to me just talk to someone it's like well i can't do that so yeah. exactly yeah. and i don't think anyone really just comes forward and i think that's i guess would be one of the big um the big things in the, the for me that i've been able to create especially in schools like last year we we did a tour of schools we did 100 talks in 20 days across 63 different schools in the united kingdom we filmed the documentary for it uh, wow. about the need for the work that we're doing in education and every single talk that i delivered there was probably 200 people in the room and I'd say there was a queue of five or 10 kids waiting to talk to me afterwards. Um, and and how, how old were these kids? We were going for, it was year 10 and 11 in the UK, which is sort of 14, 15, 16 ish. Yeah. So, um, and 
it was just unbelievable. And every single conversation I ha- had was the same. It was a kid, a young person saying to me, you are the very first person I've ever spoken to the, to spoken to about the fact that I have these exact same struggles, right? And that's someone they've never met. They've just seen talk, you know, an hour before, like, you know, that. And what I would say is, is like, to any parent listening to this who might be noticing traits of obsessive compulsive disorder, whether they're doing checks of the wardrobes, struggling to get out of the house in the morning, you know, locking, checking doors a lot, switching lights, whatever it is, flicking light switches. Um, don't don't be scared because I'm not saying you're going to end up like I did. But what I would say is, is the sooner you can have the conversations, the less likely anything like this would ever happen. And, you know, yeah. I can... I'll give you some information, some resources, some, uh, you know, audio, audio books and books that you can put in your, you know, your notes to, yeah. to pass on to any parents or they can reach out to me through Run For Your Mind on Instagram, yeah. social media, whatever that may be. Other than reaching out and using the resources that you've mentioned, you know, Tennis Canada have an entire department now that is geared towards getting help for parents, coaches and players. Is there anything else parents could do uh, to help or is it better to seek that professional help and like what advice for the parents, you know, that that can see these signs and maybe maybe worried or stressed out about it? Yeah, I think I think um, the main thing is, is uh, is going down that route of getting that professional help um, as soon as possible. But one of the, the things that I like to make very, very clear is it's a term we hear all the time, whether it be going to a doctor's and getting that help, or if you're fortunate, uh, I don't quite know how your healthcare system works over there, you might be able to access something quicker. But one of the things we always hear is wait lists. My biggest message is don't wait. You know, there's so many incredible resources, support groups that I'd imagine are probably very local to you i mean in the uk over here you can put in your postcode in this app and it'll bring all the support groups that are you know in a close vicinity to you and i don't know what what's available exactly over there we could do some digging we could get some stuff you know that might be really beneficial but the other route to recovery is personal they call it personal recovery and personal recovery looks very different with personal recovery it doesn't look like that you know it looks like an ongoing journey of how finding something that helps you whether that be running, walking, cycling, art, finding something that helps you, but also finding what communities are around you. You know, it isn't for me about that that clinical route. It's about, I've learned through other people. I've found people who were going through similar things for me. And, and that's been the biggest turning point, I guess, in my whole journey, because you feel so alone with it. So any other young person could find someone on an online support group or could find someone in a local community support group that mm. might be going through that same thing. And together, they're so much stronger than being on your own and trying to fight that battle on your own. So if you are waiting, don't wait. Find yeah. other local free support, support groups, read, listen to podcasts, listen to books, whatever that might be. But just yeah. do not just sit there and wait. We brought you over here last May and you worked with, uh, we did a camp in Whistler. Uh, and then you went on to the Alberta Tennis Centre in Calgary and you worked with with a lot of young tennis players. What was your experience like and what what did you what did you discuss with them? I think one of the big things for me coming over there was I, what really sort of shocked me in a very, very good positive way was the fact that these kids are so much better educated than we were as young people and even a lot of the youngsters in the United Kingdom who who you know were probably going through difficulties and don't really understand it these guys knew about a lot of the things I was speaking about we touched on things like the stress bucket uh, we talk about you know yeah. I, I carry this jack, giant bucket around me where I couldn't get it on the flight to Canada sadly but, um <laughs> And well, you then, used the example of a tennis basket. Right? Yeah, we did. So we used a tennis basket. And, you know, one of the, I think they really loved that, you know, what goes into our stress bucket. So using the tennis basket, putting tennis balls into the into the basket. Imagine that's, you know, your mind, what goes into your, you know, what builds that up. And, you know, there, some of them were talking about losing matches. Some of them were talking about peer pressure, which is going to be there, you know, when you're at that level and your parents want you to do well, you know. 
one thing that I, I noticed and a lot of these kids could really relate to when I was talking about how I do these rituals was how they have to play with the same ball if they win a point with the ball and they wait for yeah. the ball to come back. Um, they have to bounce the ball a certain amount of times on the line um, before they serve or they have to, yeah, all these little sort of quirks. So you're saying I'm not the only person that ever did that? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all saying the same thing. And yeah, you're not. So I think that that was one thing that really surfaced, but also... Yeah. Is is when does that become you know when does it go from bin superstition because OCD is quite common in sports people anyway you hear in football you hear football players wanting to you know some of them will play with these really old tatty boots that they've worn because they've won certain matches in them they yeah. wear the same pants when you know boxer shorts whatever it is whenever they play um, uh, so it's yeah it's one of them things that's definitely sort of there and that might just be because of the people that play those sports are the ones that are like us when we're younger where we're very highly wired and we need that extra bit of dopamine and we're always searching for that and we perform better under pressure and we do all these things and you know what makes us unique i guess but um i think that was one of the one of the big things over there and when does that become a problem does that start creeping into your day-to-day -day life which one of the one or two of the kids said actually you know what I started to do these things like the night before now I have to eat a certain meal and I have to drink a certain drink and, yeah. and, and, you know, okay, that's sometimes a good thing, but you know, does that become a problem? Can, you know, could that yeah. then go down that route of OCD? Maybe, you know, and it was, you know, very, very, it, it was, it came up quite a lot. Um, but I think one yeah. of the big things for me was looking at tennis. What I love about tennis is, is the fact that it's pretty much epitomizes resilience because no matter what stage of a tennis match you are in, you can still win that match. Whether whether yeah. you're in a football game, you might be two love down. Um, I think we we're talking about Nadal in one of the one of the finals, how he was two 0 yeah. down, you know, great point for, you know, and, and 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 he brought it back and ended up winning. And that that just isn't always possible in all sports. If you're five 0 down in the 90th minute in football, you've got no chance of bringing that back. Yeah, there's a, um, there's no clock in tennis. It's yeah, there's no clock, and I think that is what ingrained in, what what I learned from these young people who were unbelievable across you know both both camps is they they're very very resilient, and their way of thinking is also resilient, probably because of tennis, because of the fact that actually you know what I might be too I might be a set down and. You know, but yeah. I've got a chance of winning this. I can bring this back. It doesn't take much. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. all of a sudden, you can flip that. And I think that's pretty special, if I'm honest. Yeah, no, for sure. And then you, you do some work with other athletes and in other sports. How, how different is that? Like, can you tell us what you're doing and who you're supporting and yeah, so, what that's been um, like? So a lot, a lot of this, I, I do, I do a lot of work with um, local sports clubs. I've got a sponsor, a few sports clubs. I've, you know, I've done some talks to them, uh, and it can be from these big rugby players, you know, to you know, young foot, you know, soccer players, and 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 recently just started sponsoring um, a local rugby league team in Leeds, which I'm hoping to do some more stuff with as well. And yeah, it's just. It's it's very much the same no matter what happens. Like whether I'm talking to adults or I'm talking to young people, and whatever happens, you know, within these talks, they're either they've either got kids themselves who can they've seen stuff in or they've gone through it themselves from a younger age. Um, and yeah, I I really love working with with athletes with young people. I, I love the work we did over there. I think from a performance level. The, the people I spoke to in Canada, you know, the soccer team and the um, and the tennis, the, the, you know, the high performing young tennis players were, were definitely at the top of their game. Whereas over here, it's more local stuff. But I also do stuff through Rumpy Your Mind where I support young people who are, you know, going through similar things to what I was when they're younger. I provide them with a pair of running shoes. We give them, you know, a three month running plan through a, I've got a partner app called Cooper, which are incredible. Um, and they're like an online di digital coaching app where, you know, you get a plan for three months and it's tailored, you know, through real people. Um, yeah. And then it's all about getting, getting people moving, you know, they get the trainers, the kit, and I support them through the plan. Um, but it's, it did become a little bit difficult at times because, my problem is, is I'm, I'm very, when it, when it comes to meeting people, like 
I want to help everybody and I can't physically do that. And like what happened yeah. with the run for your mind stuff was helping individuals all of a sudden you are their they you are their person who they go to, you are their first port of call. Yeah. And and at times, unfortunately, you know, I do go through stages where I struggle myself and I've got to be very careful about, you know, who I'm giving my time to and and stay taking yeah. a step back and think about my own self care and making sure I can keep on top of my that and my family and supporting people around me as well so yeah that was more became a little bit difficult and we sort of reverted all the stuff through the foundation which is run it's like a community interest company which is effectively like runs similar to a charity and we raise money and then we go and deliver workshops physical education in schools we do talks that's you know assemblies um, yeah and I, I, you know i love it i absolutely love that work so yeah I'm very yeah. lucky to be in this position now Oh, it's uh, it's been really, um, yeah, quite astonishing listening to your story. And I think you will resonate with a lot of people listening. Um, so really, thank you for opening up about all that. And the last question I have, and this is maybe a difficult one, but yeah. what would you say to 12 year old Ollie? Um, I'd probably if you could speak say... to him now. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a really good question, actually. I think the big thing that I would have to say is just you know talk about how you're feeling, and and I don't know how how you know well it would have been taken. You know, we're talking twenty odd years ago now. I don't know what what would have changed, but I wish I'd have you know certainly wish I'd have found my voice from a from a young younger age, um, and I wish I'd have spoken. A little bit more about the struggles I was facing, you know, when I was trapped in them rituals and routines. But I don't know. Uh, it's 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 a real difficult one because, again, like I was lucky growing up, and I think one of my big things is like, you know, you hear a lot of stories who, with people who suffer, who have been through hell, uh, and a lot of the time it does relate to stuff like, um, you know maybe living in a in a struggle like maybe their parents didn't have any money and they you know they lived in a one bed flat and they had three brothers and sisters and whatever you know and, and going through or going through trauma or losing someone at a young age whereas mine just doesn't relate to that at all like I had I yeah. had everything in the world like I had the most loving people around me who cared for me pretty much every step of the way um, and I just think it just doesn't discriminate and Again, yeah. like going back to that point, I made the short time of you know people would probably have said that I'd be doing something, um, like like you know helping someone somewhere along the way. You know, I always did at school, and I always cared for everyone. I always made sure people weren't left out, and I think that will have been ingrained in me from my mom and my dad, and you know the people around me. But I think maybe I wouldn't really change anything. I don't think I feel like. It's it's happened. I'm here, and yeah. you know what? Like, I'm so I'm so grateful that like I'm alive and I'm living and I, I pull through because I can understand why you know people take that you know that horrible decision you know which can be so devastating for everyone around them. But it's just you know my message is you know you can get better. You got to keep going and find that one yeah. thing. Keep building on that and keep going, and um, because. Bright, brighter days are always around the corner and it might take a long time but you know you, you the world's better equipped for this now and, and you know everyone around yeah. you is more sort of clued up on what's going on so you got to keep going just got to keep yeah, keep moving great. forward so that's one of the best things about running you know whatever happens no matter how bad your day is you're still moving forwards if you keep running so it's that in itself for me is something that every single yeah. day when I'm not feeling the best i'm like i'm moving forward yeah um, regardless yeah. yeah for sure well ollie thank you you know if if there are people listening to this whether you're young players uh coaches parents if you are struggling if you any of this resonates with you and you feel like you want to reach out then obviously my door is always open please reach out to me please reach out to ollie and we will get you the help that you need and we are all in this together and we'll move forward together 
And thanks, Ollie. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, we'll, Joe. Thanks we'll, for having me. And I'll hopefully we'll get, we'll get you on again, you I think. Yeah, yeah, we'll hopefully see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thank you Take so care. much.